Amen. That is a, that's a powerful song. I love the truth of that song. That Jesus, that he did that for us. It stirs your heart, doesn't it? Amen. Amen. Would you take your Bible and go with me to the book of Judges, uh, chapter 16 this morning. Judges, chapter 16. On a day like today, our hearts are turned towards our country full of gratefulness to God for our nation and gratefulness for the sacrifice that so many have made. I was reading just a quote the other day, uh, Vice President Mike Pence a number of years ago. Uh, he said this, Today on Memorial Day we honor Americans who show no greater love for the American people. We can never repay the debt of gratitude we owe to the men and women who've given their all to preserve our freedom. Amen. We can honor them and we can remember them. He goes on to say, so long as our nation continues to produce men and women of such selfless courage and patriotism, I know that freedom will ring for ourselves and our posterity. Their duty was to serve. Our duty is to remember. Yeah. A day like today, we, we remember and we think about really the word that comes to my mind is legacy. What's been handed to us, we've received a legacy of freedom. And this morning, as I think about legacy, uh, my mind is turned to uh, not just the legacy of freedom, but the legacy of faith. We've received faith. Faith is personal, but we have an opportunity. We have a responsibility to pass that faith on to the next generation. Yeah. I believe it was President Reagan uh, that said that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. Right. And he goes on to say, it doesn't pass through the bloodstream, yeah. but it's fought for and lived for. Can I say that we could say the same thing about faith? Our faith isn't passed down through the bloodstream. It must be fought for, and I think essentially it must be lived out if we're going to pass that on. And this morning, I want to consider the legacy of faith, but we're going to look at a man who is perhaps the most unlikely person. And we think of a legacy of faith. In Judges chapter 16, we read about Samson. We read about Samson's great fall, and yet we also read of his great faith. I'll confess to you, when I think of Samson, I think of his flaws and his foolishness and all of his faults, yeah. but God remembers him for his faith. Yeah. And we'll look at Samson's faith, but in order to look at his faith, we must, we must consider his fall. Would you look at me, Judges chapter 16, look at me in verse 1, we'll read a couple verses and skip down. The Bible says, Then went Samson to Gaza, and saw there an harlot, and went in unto her. And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed him in, and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city. And were quiet until all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him. And see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And we will give thee, every one of us, eleven hundred pieces of silver. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Let's pause here for a moment. Uh, Delilah seems to have no subtlety about her. <laughs> but I don't know if what's more amazing is her lack of subtlety or Samson's foolishness, yeah. that he goes right along with it. Skip down with me to verse 15. And she said unto him, How canst thou say I love thee, when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart and said unto him, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand, and she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. She said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. And the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with the fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. 
And the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God and to rejoice. For they said, Our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson that he may make us sport. I called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport, and they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there were about upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines from my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up and of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. He bowed himself with all his might and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Here we see the tragic ending of Samson. We see the great ruin of sin in his life. And we also see a great act of faith. And the, the point of the message is that it doesn't matter our sin. God sees our faith. And God help us to take the opportunity and live for him. And Samson here, if we're gonna, before we can understand his faith, we, we see his fall. Here's a man with such potential for God. Yeah. We find Samson, the Bible says that the Spirit of God comes on him seven times. That's more than any other judge in the book of Judges. Right. Perhaps even more than any other prophet or man in the Old Testament. Talk about potential for God. And yet, it's ruined by his lusts. Yeah. It's ruined by his sin. Young people, all of us, it doesn't matter our potential. It doesn't matter our opportunities. It doesn't matter our successes. If we will not yield ourselves to God, our life can be ruined by this. And we look at here, Samson gives us a picture really of the effect, the great effect of sin in our life. And we'll see the fall of Samson number one this morning. We see the process of sin. First of all, back in the beginning of chapter 16, we find that Samson went to Gaza. And verse one, and then in verse four, he, he goes to the valley of Sorek. And we have to ask ourselves, what, Samson, what are you doing in Gaza? What are you doing in Gaza? He's not waging God's battles He's indulging his flesh. Yeah. Samson, what are you doing in the valley of Sorg? What are you doing in no man's land? It's the valley between the land of the Philistines and the land of Israel. And Samson's living there physically, but spiritually, he's living in no man's land. And we see if we, we were to come off of Judges chapter 15, we find a great victory, but that we find nearly 20 years where Samson, the great who has this great opportunity, seemingly does so little for God. We read of no great victories. We read of no turning back to God by the, by the nation of Israel. Samson, what are you doing? Well, he's playing with sin and he's toying with the will of God. Mm -hmm. When we play with sin, by the way, uh, sin often gets the better of us. Yes, amen. And we find this fall of Samson here. I think, first of all, we see sin distracts. One of the first steps in sin is, is, is to get us out of the path that God has us on. Right. We were to look back, if we were to look back in Judges chapter 14, we find that where does Samson encounter the roaring lion? By the way, I think the roaring lion is a picture of the devil. Mm -hmm. Where does he encounter him? The Bible says after he turned aside. And where does he turn aside? Into the vineyards. Yeah. Samson, what are you doing in the vineyards? Yeah. Remember, he's a Nazarite. Yeah. He's not to drink of the fruit of the vine. He's not to even touch it, the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Samson, what are you doing? By the way, one of Satan's tactics is to get us off the path that God has us on because then we're easy prey. Yeah, that's right. By the way, one of the things that Satan wants to do in our life is to get us away from the encouragement of the brethren and the healthy accountability of God's people because yeah. then we're easy prey. Right. And the first thing we see that, that Satan's attack on Samson is, is a distraction. Then we see the drawing of sin. Sin draws, we see that he, he sees in Harlot. Just like chapter 14, he saw a woman in Timnath. He sees Delilah. James chapter 1 reminds us every man is tempted when he's drawn away right. Right. of his own lust 
and enticed. There's an internal enticement and there's an external enticement. And there's, we, we find here the distraction of sin, the drawing of sin. Then we find the deception of sin. Would you look with me in, chap, in chapter 16, verse 2? Samson's there for his sin, but notice who's hiding there. The Philistines are. In verse 2 it says, and they come, in the middle of verse 2, and they come past him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city. You know what sin does? It hides it hides the consequence. You know, what the, you know what the Philistines do? They're hiding here. By the way, later we'll see uh, Samson and Delilah. We'll find the Philistines are hiding there too. And we find out they're not just hiding, they're hunting Samson. Samson's hunting for what he thinks he wants in life. He's hunting after what he can get, but he doesn't realize he is being hunted by his own desires. Satan likes to use our desires against us. That's why we have to guard our heart. Uh, there's an illustration of a, uh, it's told in the Arctic when the, an Eskimo wants to, when it wants to hunt a wolf, it'll take a knife. It'll, he'll take a knife and he'll sharpen it razor sharp. And he'll, uh, he'll, 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 place it, he'll place it in some blood and he'll let that freeze on there and he'll do this a number of times. And then he'll take it out in the snow and he'll stick it hilt down and point up. And the wolf's keen sense of smell will, will sense that. And he'll chase after that and he'll find it. He'll begin to lick the knife and he'll taste the blood and he'll, he'll begin to lick it voraciously, but he doesn't realize the moment that the razor-sharp edge has pierced his own tongue. And the morning sun finds the wolf dead in the snow, hunted by his own desires. You know what Satan does in our life? He hunts us by our own desires. Right. We have to guard our hearts against these things. Uh, by the way, S Samson could have justified himself. We find he does that frequently. He could have said, well, what's wrong with companionship? Or he could have said, I, I like this woman here. Now, I don't want to put words in his mouth. By the way, we have to be careful about justifying our own desires. Yeah. We, when we rip a desire out of context, we can justify nearly anything. Right. And, and Samson here, he's doing that which is obviously sinful. Sin is deceptive. And he's hunting, and Satan is hunting the life of Samson, hunting the life of the believer. And what does it produce? It produces destruction. We see Samson, uh, he finds Delilah, he thinks he's in love, and, and he, he convinces himself that he is, and, and she eventually, I don't know how he falls for it, but she tells him, Samson, how, how can you be bound? How can, how can, we, how can I afflict you? <laughs> Those are some nice, kind, loving words, aren't they? And, uh, and he falls for it. By the way, sin will make you do some incredibly foolish things, won't it? You ever, you ever sat and just like scratch your head and say, what were you thinking? By the way, sometimes it doesn't take sin to, to think that about some folks. Sometimes, but sometimes we look at some, we look at, excuse me, we look at some folks and our heart breaks for them. We think, what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? Why would you do that? Sin can make us do some incredibly foolish things. And it brings, it brings a destruction here. We see the process of sin. We see the product of sin. They rush in. Samson, his hair has been cut. He's told Delilah, that he's a Nazarite unto God, and if, if, if he breaks his vow, then the power of God will come off of him. And he breaks the last part of his vow, and it's that moment God takes his hand off him, and, and she says, Samson, the Philistines be upon thee. And notice, what the, notice what the Philistines do. What the Philistines do to Samson is a picture of what sin does to us in our own life. In verse 21, the Bible says, The Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass. By the way, brass speaks of judgment. They bound him. You know what sin does? Sin binds. Yeah. Sin enslaves. You remember Romans chapter 6? Uh, who, who, who we yield ourselves to, servants to obey. That's, that's the servants we are. When we listen to the orders of sin, we make ourselves a slave to sin. Yeah. By the way, before Christ, outside of Christ, all, Christ, all of us are bound in sin. Yeah. All of us are bound in sin. And the second Timothy says, we're, taken, uh, we're captured in the snare of the devil, taken captive by him at his will. And when we indulge in sin, this is the, this is the binding that takes place. But sin not only binds, sin blinds. Notice what they did. They, they put out his eyes. But can I suggest that Samson's blindness began well before they put out his eyes? The lack of discernment, the lack of understanding that God was not with him, the forsaking of God's will, one of the worst things we can do and the, the greatest, perhaps the greatest threat to our Christian life is allowing sin to remain in your life. It, it clouds, it confuses, it brings a lack of clarity in our life.
That's what sin does. Sin binds, it blinds, but then I think we see sin brands. Notice what they do. They take him and they, they put him in the prison house. That's shameful. What's he doing in the prison house? He's grinding. In other words, he's standing next to an ox or a donkey, doing the work of the lowest of animals. The great Samson, who the Philistines feared, is now lowered to this. You know what sin does? It brings shame in our life. I'm sure there wasn't a day that went by that Samson thought to himself, oh, that I, oh, I wish I wouldn't have listened to Delilah. Oh, I wish I would have just done what God said. Oh, I wish I would have just obeyed the Lord. And he lives in this regret. By the way, he's mocked and humiliated. Sin humbles us. I think it's interesting. His eyes, his hair is shaved. We'll, we'll see in a moment. His hair begins to grow back. But can I tell you, sin scars. His eyes never grow back. Yeah. There's a scarring in that sin. I praise God. We'll talk about it for a moment. There is a new beginning with God. Sin isn't the end of the story, but it does produce scars. Right. We see here sin brands, and finally sin breaks. Sin yeah. breaks Samson. What's the breaking of Samson? He's bound. He's blind. He's branded. He's humiliated. He's broken. But I think the great breaking of Samson we find in verse 20. He wist not. He knew not that the Lord was departed from him. Yeah. The great break in our life is not, the, not the, the humiliation of outside circumstance. The great breaking in our life is when there is a break in our fellowship with God. Yeah. That's the great break in here, the great breaking of Samson's life. He is, he is a broken man. And typically when I think of Samson, this is the man that I think of who's given into sin and his life is ruined and it's broken by sin and he's and humbled. And it'd be easy to end the story right here and say that's that's the end. Yeah. Outwardly to look at Samson and say, what more could Samson do for God? I mean, he's blind. What could he possibly do? But I'm so glad that sin is not the end of the story. Amen. We can have a new beginning with God. Would you keep your finger here? Look with me in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. This great hall of faith, we find some illustrious names like Enoch and, and Noah. Men like Abraham and Jacob, Isaac. We find men like Moses. Great faith in God. Look with me in verse 32 of Hebrews chapter 11. The Bible says, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of, notice that next name, Samson, and of Jephthah and of David also, and Samuel and of the prophets. You mean Samson included in the hall of faith? Samson known for his faith? And I, 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 have, I think to myself, if I pause and think to myself, I think, wait a second, I missed something here. We look at the life of Samson. How is Samson a man of faith? And, and how does God remember Samson for his faith? I've already alluded to it. One of the great applications is sin isn't the end. Yeah. And one of the things we often repeat around here is I'm glad that God is not just a God of second chances. He's a God of new beginnings. Yeah. That's Samson's story, and friend, that can be our story too. Amen. Whatever our past is, that does not write our future legacy. Yeah. Our faith can be our legacy. Yeah. And we are not defined by the sin and the ruin of the past, but if we go forward with God, we can have a new legacy of faith in God. And we look at Samson here, and he, he has this, this, this legacy of faith, and we think, where is Samson's faith? Look with me back in, chapter, in Judges chapter 16. I want you to look at Samson's prayer here. We see Samson's fall. Number two, we see Samson's faith. We see his faith in, his, in the prayer of Samson. Notice in verse 28, And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me. I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines from my two eyes. I think about this prayer, and I think, that's a big prayer. I mean, consider it for a moment. Here is, here is Samson. I mean, he is a broken man. He can't even walk to those two pillars. I mean, as he walks there, uh, the people around him, the Philistines around him, they're praising, look what, look what our God did. Think about the shame that Samson's experiencing. He can't even walk in there. He, he's bound, he's blind, he's broken. And yet he prays, God, would you remember me? God, would you have mercy on me? Yeah. 
God, would you strengthen me? God, would you give me one more chance to do your will for my life? Yeah. That's what he's praying. I don't know about you. I would, be, I would think possibly I'd be praying, Lord, would you get me out of this? Lord, would you, would you somehow restore my eyes? Uh, Lord, would you, would you somehow send, send a deliverer? Or would you send a prophet maybe to encourage me? Uh, Samson's not thinking any of that. He's saying, Lord, would you give me one more chance to do your will? Yeah. And I love his faith. It begins in prayer, but it does not end in prayer. His faith it makes it out of his prayer. He, he, he cries out to God, but then he commits himself to God. He begins in prayer, but then he ends with pushing those pillars over. You see, his, his faith is not just his prayer. His faith is his action. And God remembers Samson for his faith. Yeah. That Samson story, that can be our story. Yeah. And I think about, perhaps we might think, well, I've not done any great sin like Samson. I mean, I, I, there's no Delilahs in my life. And I might be able to pat myself on the back, back excuse me, and say, well, listen, I don't have any of that. And I could coast my way into heaven congratulating myself for all the things I haven't done. But can I say, our, our legacy is our faith. What do I mean by that? Our faith is, is not just simply the things I say I believe. It's not just simply some, some statement of faith. It's not just a, a comprehensive list of everything that I agree with about God or the Bible. My faith is the, is the truth that's, that's reached down to the roots of my heart and grown up into my life and grown up into my living. And it's not just what I say I believe, but it's come out in my life. Our, our, our legacy is not just the truth we agree with, it's the faith that we live by. I'll never forget reading a, a quote a number of years ago, two or three years ago, and it said this, we, we, speaking about children, it said, we teach what we believe but we reproduce what we are. Yeah. We teach what we believe, but we reproduce what we are. And I think about a legacy of faith. I think about, I think about my children. I don't want them just to have a head full of knowledge, although I want them to know about God. I want them to have a heart for God. Yeah. I want them to have a heart that, that believes God and that they don't just hear what mom and dad say, but they've seen it lived out in their life. That they see that, that God is worthy. It's not just something I say, but God is worthy. So we're going to get up on a Sunday morning and we're going to go to church. God's been good to us and he's given us so much. And so we're, we're glad to give back to God. I mean, God has saved us and we want other people to know this message. I'm not just going to talk about that. I'm going to act on that. Amen. And so they receive not just the truth that I've said, not just the truth that I've heard, but what I've lived out that's my faith. That's, my, that's the legacy that we leave behind to our children. I want my children to know. I want them to believe that serving God is the greatest thing they can do with their life. Yeah. I want them to know, and I don't want just them to know about God. I want them to have a heart that beats for God, that yearns to serve God and loves God with every fiber of their being. Amen. But they're not going to catch that, excuse me, by reading my statement of faith. How are they going to catch that as they see me live that out in front of them? A legacy, a faith that we pass on. I think about Samson, a prayer full of faith, but it doesn't end in faith. He acts on that faith. I want you to look at his prayer this, look at his prayer this morning. We see it's a prayer of faith, but first of all, it's a prayer for mercy. Look what he says in, in chapter 20, in verse 28, he says, And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray thee. The first, the first time we find this prayer, remember me, is prayed by Samson. Interestingly, the last time we find this prayed to God is prayed by the thief on the cross. Remember what he prays? As he's, he's first ridiculed the Lord. He's mocked him with the other, with the other thief on the cross. And then he realizes this man has done nothing, done nothing amiss. We justly deserve this. And he looks over to the Lord and he, and he calls in faith, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. In other words, he's saying, Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. It's a prayer of faith. It's a, it's a prayer for mercy. And as, as Samson prays this prayer, he says, he says, Lord, remember. He's saying, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should even remember me. Lord, I've sinned. I, I've broken your law. Lord, I'm not even worthy that you should even look at me or remember me. 
But God, would you have mercy on me? When we call out to God in mercy, that's a prayer God hears. By the way, you may be here this morning and you, you may not be a Christian. What I mean by that, I'm not saying that we're part of some other religion. You identify as some other religion, but what I mean by Christian is perhaps you're here and you've not called on God to save you. You've not called out in faith to God. No one is born a child of God. We're all born, as, we're all born into this world, but we're born separated from God. We become a child of God by being born into His family. And how we do that is crying out to God for mercy. Lord, I don't deserve salvation, but would you save me? Lord, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Lord, would you save me? It's a prayer for mercy. And perhaps this morning as we think about leaving a legacy of faith, it begins with a cry for mercy. We can't leave a legacy of faith if we don't have faith in God. Right. Perhaps the first step for one, some, for one this morning might be, Lord, would you forgive me? Would you make me a Christian? Would you make me a child of God? Yeah. It could also be someone who's living, who, who, who maybe perhaps uh, identifies with Samson and say, I understand, I understand the breaking of sin. God, would you have mercy on me? Yeah. By the way, it doesn't have to be some great sin. God could put his finger on anything in our life, and the appropriate response in our life would be, God, be merciful to me. It's a prayer for mercy, but then secondly, I want you to see it's a prayer for might. Notice what he says, I pray thee and strengthen me. Strengthen me. Samson seemingly finally understands that his strength was never his own. It was God's. And now as a broken man, he realizes his strength does not come from his hair. His strength comes from God. Yeah. And all that we would all learn that. My strength doesn't come from my abilities. It doesn't come from my successes. It doesn't come from my career, from my finances, from my home, from my discipline, from my family. Our strength has only one source, and that's God. Yeah. He is our sufficiency. And Samson finally comes to a place of surrender where he realize, was, realizes without God, I can do nothing. My desires bring death. God's desires bring life. And if I'm going to do what God wants me to do, then I need God's strength yeah. Yeah. in my life. Uh, can I make application? In one sense, it's easy to live a good enough life. It's easy to live good enough to impress other people, where other people can pat me on the back and say, you're doing a good job. Yeah. But to live and become the man God wants me to be, I can't do that on my own. Right. I need God. Yeah. I think about raising my children. I can raise some good kids. I can raise some good citizens. I can raise some, perhaps I might think some, some I, looking at maybe the, the worst in the world around and say, I think I can maybe do a little better job. But that's not the goal. Yeah. God is the goal. And if my kids are going to love God with all their heart and serve God, I need God's help to do that. Yeah, I need His might and His strength in my life. And we need God's strength. And we find His strength comes from a death to self. As he dies, that he, there's this victory that's birthed. And finally, I think we see it's a prayer for meaning. It's not only a prayer for mercy, a prayer for might, it's a prayer for meaning. Notice what he says at the end of verse 28, that I may be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. It, it seems a little bit twinged with selfishness, perhaps. <laughs> but what he's doing, I believe, is he's praying for the will of God. See, in Judges chapter 13 and verse 5, God promised that he would begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. And it's as if Samson now faced with his imminent death, realizing that it's, it's serve God now or else there'll be no other chance. And he says, God, would you give me one last chance to serve you before I die? God, I'd rather serve you and accomplish your will. That's greater to me even than life itself. I think about that. Where's, where's that passion in my life? I think about John Knox, the famous reformer. He cried out, God, give me Scotland or I die. Yeah. Where is that passion? What, is, what has God given us, that one thing that we must do before we die? I, I enjoyed the other day sitting with Pastor and Brother O'Malley at our mission conference and uh, Brother John Kukenzi, we went out for coffee. And uh, Brother Kukenzi was just talking about the things that God had put on his heart to do in the ministry in Brazil. And he made a comment as he was, as he was talking about training men for ministry. He said, I believe God has given this, put this in my heart. It's, it's something I must do yeah. before I die. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. 
I thought, I began to think of myself, what is, what's the one thing God's put in my heart that I must do before I die? Yeah. What's the one thing God's put in your life to do that we must accomplish, that, that we must accomplish before we die? What, what are we reaching out for and, and living by faith? What are we accomplishing for God? That's what we're living for. That is the faith that we're passing on. And God, help me, I look at Samson. Yes, he's got this past, but there's a new beginning with God. But the application to me, and I think in my life and for many of us, our faith is our legacy. Yeah. Our faith, what are we doing for God? It's, you know what it is? It's a tremendous opportunity. It's a tremendous opportunity to live and to commit ourselves to God. Samson, I think of him, I think of his faults. I think of his flaws. I think of his failures. God remembers him for his faith. Amen. That's Samson's story. That can be your story. God will not, God, if we're saved, that sin's under the blood. Yeah. God will remember us for our faith. Yeah. What are you trusting God for? Yeah. What are you accomplishing for God? And when I, when I read the life of Samson, I walk away with my faith is my, is my legacy. God helped me to be a man full of faith. And my faith isn't just what I say I believe. My faith is the truth that I'm living out. That's made it, that's reached so deep into my heart that it's coming out in my life. And my children are going to have any hope of living for God. They don't just need to hear about it from me. They need to see it lived in my life. Yeah. I think about the young people God lets me influence. Your young people, precious young people. It's not enough just to stand up and tell them, this is, this is, this, these are some good things. they got to see it lived in my life, yeah. in our lives. That's, that's, that's the faith that we're passing on. It's so much more than what I say. It's what I live. Yeah. Our legacy, what are we passing on? Can I tell you? It's the, the measure of our faith. It's not what we know. It's what we're living. That's what we're passing on. And Samson... He leaves a tremendous legacy of faith. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what people say. It matters what God says. Yeah. And Samson remembers what God says. God says, Samson, he's a man of faith. And that tells me there's no time to quit. Yeah. Anytime we can begin right where we're at and make a new beginning with God. Yeah. Let today be the start of a legacy of faith. And you may be here this morning. You may not be saved. That, that faith begins with crying out to God for mercy. Are you saved this morning? Do you know the Lord is your Savior? Ask Him to save you. Maybe God has convicted you about some sin that you're in the process or you're experiencing the product of sin. Cry out to God for mercy. Let Him give you a new beginning. Perhaps you'd say, I need God's strength. I don't just want to get along. I want to do what God's given me to do. Maybe your prayer might be, God, give me your might. Perhaps your prayer might be a prayer for meaning. Lord, I don't want to do my will. I want to accomplish your will. God, would you increase my passion? to do your will in my life. And God help us to leave a legacy of faith. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you are a God of new beginnings. Thank you that our sin is not the end of the story. And thank you that your grace is greater than our sin. And Lord, I pray that we would live by faith. We know it's our faith that overcomes the world. It gives the victory. And Lord, I pray you help us to live that out in our life. Lord, thank you for your mercy to us. Thank you for your, your goodness to us. I pray if there's one here who's not saved, that you would save them before it's too late. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, your heads bowed and eyes closed? In just a moment, we'll stand to sing, and the invitation will begin to sing, and we'll begin to respond to God. I invite you to respond to God. Perhaps your faith, your legacy begins with a cry of mercy. Perhaps it begins with a cry for strength, for might. Perhaps it begins with a cry for meaning. But would you let God help you and I write a legacy of faith? Let's respond to the Lord this morning. In just a moment, the piano will begin to play. In just a moment, we'll begin to sing. And I invite you to respond to the Lord. If you're not saved this morning... You could come forward and someone will show you how to trust Christ from the Bible. They won't embarrass you. They'll show you how you can know God. I invite you in this moment, even before we begin singing, respond to the Lord.